And good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Metal Magdalene with Jet Right here on Metal Messiah Radio. Today, I have a special guest with me. I have artist, writer, composer, legend, Mr. Devin Townsend. Welcome to the show, Devin. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to be here again. So, so Devin, how long have you been in the music business? Since 1991, I guess. So what is that? Uh, 91, 2001... 2011, so it's 20, it's like 27 years or something. Holy mackerel. Now, how would you say you've progressed as a musician over the years? Well, I'm much less concerned about whether or not people understand me now, which is great. Because I think um, I think my, my whole thing has always been, I don't think what I do is weird. I don't think what I do is is crazy or bizarre or anything. I just don't. It's just... And I've spent a lot of years trying to rationalize the work to people who do. Or just like, I don't understand why you would do that, therefore explain it to me. And I've always felt insecure about it. But I think over the past couple of years, I'm like, oh, I don't care. Oh, my God. I'm 46. I'm, you know, I'm a parent. I, I've got tons of things. And my reasons for doing um, things that people may think of as, as absurd are simply, I think it's funny or I think it's cool. It's there's no real uh, agenda there other than that, and that's how it's changed. <laughs> okay, so today we're here to talk about a very special album and show. You're about to release a live album, but not just any live album. This album celebrates the 20th anniversary of your landmark album, Ocean Machine. First of all, Devin, why is that album so special for you? Uh, well, it's... Uh... It's Ocean Machine. I think it's um, something that has set up an archetype for my career. And I think the album itself is, is not much different in how it had come about than any of my other albums. But because it was such a struggle to get that one heard and to get it signed, it, it forced me at the time to start my own record label so I could license it to Sony in Japan, which at the time seemed like... Um, disappointing because i was hoping it would just be sort of taken up by a label like roadrunner or whatever and and then they would put their machine to it and work but in hindsight the fact that it didn't work out that way has been the thing that has allowed me to be successful in the ways that i am uh strapping got signed to century media and then i had um a non-exclusive deal with them and by having to license ocean machine i was also able to license then infinity and then physicist and terria and accelerated and synchestra and then i got to do uh dev lab and hummer independent of all of that and and it just ended up being something that now i can do really whatever i want as long as i'm taking into consideration uh the audience i can do whatever i want and i think that as a result of it forcing me to do that it's great for me to revisit ocean machine because it almost uh, pays homage to the thing that set me up, right? True. And now this this show was played at the ancient Roman theater in Plovdiv, Bulgaria. So tell us about this theater and what were your thoughts when you first visited the place? When you say it out loud, that sounds super epic, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. You know, the ancient Roman theater in Plovdiv, <laughs> Bulgaria. Uh, when I first saw it, I thought, God, someone's going to slip on these stairs and crack their head open. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. Oh, God. I actually talked, yeah, it sucked. I, I talked to uh, a lady yesterday, and it was her friend that actually had wiped out during the oh, show. Geez. But he's okay, and um, and he was really cool about it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things where you look at this thing and, and the romance of it all is such that you're just like, wow, this would be great. It's going to be a hot summer night and there will all be people, perfect acoustics and everything. But as it turned out, it was absolutely incredibly cold and, uh, you know, everybody's freezing their balls off and um, somebody wiped out. And then because it's basically a big concrete wash basin, the, the sound guy was struggling with it from minute one. But ultimately, the guy who slipped ended up being okay. Ultimately, the fact it was cold worked out because the bass player, Squid, who was there, has uh, an advanced case of multiple sclerosis. And the fact that uh, it was cooler really helped him. 
and uh, we had a great sound guy who managed to pull it together. So, you know, happy accidents all around. Well, I'm glad nobody got killed, Devin. That's always a good thing. Fuck yeah, that's how I feel just in general. <laughs> You know? So how long did it take to set up the theater with all this lights and sound and and were you afraid you might like break the theater or something? Or it sounds <laughs> like it was damaging itself the way you talk about it. Well, I mean, it's made out of marble and it's lasted for a couple thousand years. So I think whatever I can do to it is not going to make too much of a dent. But I think more than, I mean, the setup took a full day. Because you have to rent it daily, right? So you can't get in there like the night before and do the thing. And we had a couple of days of rehearsal with the orchestra, which helped. But um, like any of these situations, Retinal Circus, where we had to put together like this sort of theater production in a day, and uh, Royal Albert Hall, where we had all this crazy synced up, you know, alien stuff that had to go along with it. I think if, if you let the what ifs in any situation, uh, dominate your uh, your process while you're setting it up. You'll never get anything done because it's like anything. What if you get hit by a bus when you leave the, the house in the morning? I mean, if you go with that, you'll just never leave the house. So you just kind of have to suspend that and just roll with it. And Plovdiv was another example of me just waking up that morning and being like, well, it could absolutely go to shit, but uh, let's take a try anyway and see what happens, and it ended up working. So tell us about the show itself, and what did it consist of as far as, like, the different musicians and the orchestras and the such? Well, we had to build a stage on the on the thing, and we had, like, fireworks, and we had, um, you know, a 25-person choir and a 70-person orchestra. And they're all union, right? Like, and although the the costs in Bulgaria are significantly less um, than other places in the EU, it's still such that you've got to structure your set that you play the songs that require all the the orchestral people first, and then you know you can get rid of certain parts of the choir, so you only have to pay for the time that they're there, and then. And so as it goes, it's it's like certain elements of the orchestra just end up packing up and leaving. And then by the time we got to the second set, the uh, uh, the Ocean Machine set, everybody was like torn down and gone, and it required uh, a lot. And you know we had these flame pots up on top there where the uh, where the choir sits, and during the simple lullaby, we were blowing off flames and all this sort of thing. And, Again, that was in the exact same spot as where the choir was. So the logistics of just making sure nobody went up in flames and, you know, it was all fortunate for me, handled by Paul Collis and a bunch of the other people that were doing, um, you know, uh, Vassil and the guy who in the local uh, company that were taking care of it. But as you can imagine, everybody had their work cut out for them. You know, the band had to learn all these things and the techs had to be set up to do all this stuff. And then the lighting guys had to do all these sort of cues. And then the the click tracks had to go to the orchestra as well so the conductor could hear. And it's a, uh, if you take it apart like that and you look at the list of things that need to be done, I mean, it's daunting for anybody. And again, if you looked at that list, there'd be a good chance you'd be like, oh, I, we shouldn't try this. So... My technique for coping with that is I just don't look at the list. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for this particular show, Devin, what was the lineup of your band? Well, um, it was the same band that had been with me for the past six or seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dave and Ryan and Brian and Mike. And that was kind of, although... Devon Townsend Project started without those guys. It was with Key and, and Addicted and Deconstruction and Ghosts, and they were all different people on those records. By the time I got to Epic Cloud Z2 and Transcendence, I ended up working with those guys. And um, they were the ones that we used for this. And if I'm being perfectly honest, I was starting to uh, have a wandering eye for musicians and, and situations about a year prior. But um, those guys uh, uh, were of such help to me and such a great group of people to be with that uh, 
I was really happy to do this performance with them, right? And, and consequently, it was very difficult for me to, to end the DTP because, you know, it's like you hate hurting people that you care about who have put in all that work. But, um, but it, was, it almost acts as a swan song as a result of that. But those were the guys. And what was your personal feelings when performing that first song live for the audience in that theater? Besides hoping nobody goes up in flames or something like that. I think it was something to do with, man, I wish I'd had more sleep. <laughs> you know, like I, I got a pretty wicked sort of streak of insomnia just in general. And we had done hundreds of shows by that time that year. So... Um, as awesome of a thing as it was, I was really trying to caffeinate myself before we went out on stage and keep hydrated and, and all this. And it took me a good four or five songs for me to be able to really be like, oh, this is awesome. I'm so psyched. Because the first couple songs, I'm just like, oh, my God, is it going to work? Are the orchestra, is this guy too cold? Is, you know, I mean, is my guitar going to be out of tune? And But like any other situation, once you sort of surrender to it, then you're good, you're good to go. Right. And um, and it didn't take me too long to surrender to it. And now, how would you describe your overall experience with this entire project and what it all meant to you, Devin? Like DTP or the pl or the plot? The, the plot did thing. It's like a gift in a way. It's you're so worked up and, and hung up on the on the specifics of it while you're doing it that sometimes it's easy to miss it. So the fact that it took me a couple of songs, I think, is inevitable. But once I got into it, my only thought was uh, gratitude, I guess. Gratitude for the audience that had traveled to be there. Gratitude for the band who had gone out of their way to learn it. The orchestra who had done this stuff and were willing to participate in, in my music and the management for for going out of their way to to make it happen budget wise and sound man for for pulling it together in an environment that could very easily just go to shit and you know and i think that's that's the only reasonable reaction to this situation as opposed to uh i don't know what would be the alternative like i deserve this and, uh, you know, uh, how come my string broke? You know what I mean? It's like all those thoughts mm -hmm. are just going to make the thing less valuable. But I, I really was just like, I'm really thankful for this. And, and that really helped, I think. And now, was this particular show the last thing that you're doing with DTP? We toured after that. We did a tour in America with Clutch that was really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and weird. then... Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, and uh, and then I very happily have moved on to the stage that I'm in now, which is a lot of creative exploration and um, and uh, um, being happily perplexed by it all. <laughs> so, so tell us more about being happy, happy and perplexed. I mean, what are some of the things going through your mind with like the next? Devin Townsend well I think that one thing that I've come to the conclusion of is that I don't have any objective mm -hmm. all the stuff that I've done is just it's what happened I, I kind of not fell into it because it was it was very intentional in terms of each step but the trajectory of it is just it's just a happy accident and I forget where I was recently. We were driving through, I might have been Dallas even, and and I just was looking out the window of the bus and I see all these big buildings, these corporate buildings, you know, these big conglomerates, whatever, Procter & Gamble or any of these massive things. And I'm thinking to myself, it was a bit of, a, of an awakening where I was like, I don't have the drive to be involved with something like that. Like, in order to be the CEO of a company like that or any company that is just like, like look at Procter & Gamble, they just keep absorbing different companies, you know? It's like this crazy mitosis of just 
massive entities absorbing others and the objective is ultimately just to be the biggest fucking entity right i mean i couldn't care less i could not care less and i've realized that recently i'm like i don't want to be a massive entity that sucks you'd never go to the beach and if you did it would like you'd be around with armed guards i mean it's it's not what life is about for me life is about being around the people i care for having time for myself having enough money that i don't have to stress about money but i think you know like if you had a million dollars in the bank as good as good as that would be and i think that's still reasonable i think you know some point in your life you could maybe accumulate so when you open up your bank account it says a million dollars right but i'm so far from that but i still don't have to, like i can pay my rent you know what i mean it's like i've got a guitar with my name on it um i have a house i got a car i don't want any more than that and if more than that came eventually it would only be because i was doing things that that just led to that naturally as opposed to seeking it out and this particular period of my creative life i realized that the decisions i've made up to this point that have put me in this place were exactly the right ones for me mhm and at this point the idea of like working to become the biggest working to absorb other things and and you know i got it what a drag <laughs> you know what i mean like like once you have a guitar you play music with it as opposed to like now that i've got a guitar this is the first step in my journey to acquire uh all the guitar companies it just seems like so fucking greedy like i just i remember reading something in the onion i thought was great oh, no. it said um walmart reaches its objectives that it had in the beginning and then shuts down you know mm-hmm. and it was like it was like a fake satirical interview with the owner of walmart and he's like well in the beginning we said we wanted to achieve this goal and open up 10 stores worldwide and we've done that so see ya <laughs> you know what i mean it's like and in a way even though that's sarcastic i totally relate to that it's like it's like at what point is it enough and it's basically in my life it's enough i uh it would be nice eventually to have a million dollars in the bank or something so that you didn't have to say no to the guacamole you know what i mean that's <laughs> that's great but with that as your objective it's it seems to be in opposition to what it is that this certain period of my life that i find myself in now is is requesting of me and it's just like dude just write just write and it doesn't matter some days you don't want to write some days you write and it's the same shit you've always been writing some days you've written and it's stuff that it, it can't be sold and then other days and this is the thing that's also confusing is other days i write a pop song and i'm like oh shit if i put this out then what but if i don't put it out is it, am i just doing it because i'm trying to be like you know i got to keep my street cred or something it's like <laughs> you know so it's 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 this really interesting period for me right now where i'm just kind of doing all this stuff and and i'm also you know exercising a lot and eating good food and hanging out with my buddies and and it's all going to come to an end soon i mean i got to i got to get back on the road and do all this stuff but in the meantime I'm just like this is a great moment for me to figure it out. So I'm happily perplexed. There's my long-winded answer which also defines this period for me. So so Devin, if you do a pop song, would you do it under Devin Townsend or would you change your name? Well, there's the thing. Like what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? You know, I don't know, man, and it's like you know, it's like I don't know. I mean, on Ocean Machine there's pop songs. It's it's just it's it's silly. But at the, at the same time it's like um accountability is also a big deal for me as well. So 
I'm happy to think about any of these things, any of these things. But it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to do it, right? But, um, but I also like to think that I'm, uh, I trust myself enough that if I feel compelled to go in a direction, it's the direction I should go in, and, and then you just you, the chips fall where they may, right? Absolutely. So, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, DTP and not doing any. Does it make you a little sad that, you know, you're not doing that anymore? Is it like, I don't know. Are you going to resurrect it again? Like Slayer, do a farewell? <laughs> do Sailor. Um, it's sad because the guys are sad. Mm -mm. You know? Yeah. And it's it's sad because some of the audience didn't want it to end. That's sad. But I'm happy. So, you know, I think if there's anything that I've realized over the past couple of years, I'm 46 now. I've spent a large part of my creative life and my personal life doing things for the sake of others. Mm -hmm. And... I think there's a nobility to that, but I think if it gets to the point where you're sacrificing yourself and the um, happiness of your family and the people that are really close to you for the sake of others, whether or not that is touring for 11 months of the year right. or, you know, um, playing the martyr and just being like, oh, I don't really want to go on tour right now, but because of the people, I'm going to do it. I mean... There's a certain amount of that, that that it's compromise, and compromise is a great thing in life, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But there's also another part where you realize it's just like, well, what do you want, dude? <laughs> you know? True. It's like, you don't have to do this. You've got a studio. You know, you've got a studio that you can, like, I've got a place that I can write. I've got tons of people that own the studios that I can work at. Um... I don't need to be on the treadmill right now. And so I chose to not be. And it's sad because I hate hurting people. But it's also indicative of growth for me because for the first time I've been able to really sit and really think about it and really write and really enjoy my life. And I can't imagine that's not going to result in something that is really honest from me musically. And I think that if the fact that uh, the audience has supported me for so long uh, can be defined in any way, it's because it's coming from a place that's honest. And this is honestly what I needed to do right now. And as sad as it may be, I can't make any excuses for it. And now you had mentioned that, you know, eventually you got to get back there out on the road. What are you going to do out there, Devin? Oh, uh, can we, can I ask, can, can I answer that in six months? I don't want to think about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to think about it yet. <laughs> so, you know, that ma management called me up the other day and was like, well, we've got to start thinking about tours. I was like, oh, come on, please. Just let me just go to the beach. Just fuck. I've been doing this for 25 years, man. Just let me just, I will answer it. I'll think about it. It'll be really cool. But just. I just, you know, I just want to drink some coffee now and, and not fucking beach. think about it. Go to the beach, mow the lawn. It's true. Throw the trash out for crying it's out true. loud. Oh, my God. I mean, and it's like, it seems like these are simple things, but it, it, all, it all makes sense to me because I think we're also in a society that values self-sacrifice in such a way that to not pursue, you know, the mitosis gobbling up of success and being the biggest and the most successful and the most visible and the most likes on social media. Like, to not pursue that seems like insanity. But, I mean, really, it's like I, I'm starting to think that, that the pursuit of that is the problem with shit. And I think it's also the problem with music in a lot of ways because then you're – your sphere of influence in terms of what you write ends up just being about the process. It's like, mm -hmm. here's my new record. It's about touring. And 
and accumulating. You know, it's it doesn't interest me. I'd much rather be like, here's a new record. It's about what it's like to be 46 for me. <laughs> you know, oh God. <laughs> and that, you know, maybe it's a niche market. Right. Here's a new record about when I go pee in the middle of the night, I have to sit or whatever, <laughs> you know, but but ultimately it's what I feel I need to do. And so I'm going to do it. Those those almost sound like country songs now, Devin. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. Yeah, maybe. I don't think it's country. From what I could tell, from what I've written, it's pretty <laughs> fucking far from Not country. the peeing and sitting down and the boys going for swimming there. No, no. Yeah, no, no, no. No, no, that's, again, that's... At 46 it's, uh, years old. <laughs> well, 46 years old. Oh, God. Debbie. I don't know. <laughs> no. You got to do what you got to do, right? And I mean, my hope is that, you know, uh, as always, what I do acts as some sort of a help for others in some ways. And maybe the fact that I'm not pursuing um, things in the ways that would be typically deemed as like um, appropriate will make a good statement ultimately who knows but i'm having a good time and i'll think about touring in six months all right Devin, thank you so much for coming on the show and all the best to you and we look forward to hearing from you again in six months wicked talk to you soon 